Welcome to our second lecture covering legal correspondence or the legal letter. I thought I would go over the PowerPoint that I have available to everybody posted in the um, client correspondence module. Kind of go over a couple of things about it. I'm not going to pour over this because my a cheat sheet form is a more detailed uh, rendering of the information that you need. But let's do look at a couple of things. The first thing that I'd like to flag is the sample documents module. We haven't used that at this point in the course, but you will be using it very frequently. And sometimes I get students asking me, well, how do I find it? I don't hide it, it's very uh, readily available, but I also, um, do want you to uh, get used to the experience of finding things on your own. And so what I will tell you is it's, I'll, I'll double check to make sure somehow or another I haven't turned it off and then I'll say it's there, go look for it. Because when you're in the real world, you're not going to run to the attorney every time you're not able to find something on Westlaw or you're not able to find something in O'Connor's or some other resource. You're going to have to kind of sweat it out and look for things. I'm going to show you where the sample documents file is, but just keep in mind that throughout this course, there will be times that you're like, I'm not quite sure where that is. Embrace that. That is the practice of law. You can work through it. You may not find it in three minutes. That's okay. You got time. Spend the time, think it through, and then keep on working until it gets to that destination. If you genuinely can't find it, come to my office hours. I will be glad to show you how to go about finding that information. Um, but just know that it's very, very likely to be there. Okay, so let me show you where to find it. There are lots of modules in this class. And I think sometimes what happens may be that students open modules and it's just so, distant from one module for another that they forget that these modules, that there's lots of them and that they're arranged, you know, pretty reasonably, I would say. And so it's one of the modules here and it's one of the modules at the end. I've gone through and closed all the modules so I can find it. Oops, I didn't close this one. Um, so I can find them pretty readily. And you can see that the sample dockets module, sample documents module is the next to last one. I change these out from time to time. There are flaws with almost all of them. Some of the flaws I have intentionally put in, some of the, the flaws were already in the examples that I got and I didn't correct them. Don't assume that because you have a module that it's automatically correct and you don't, I assume you have a, a model that's automatically correct. And throughout this course, you are supposed to correct modules. The two things you shouldn't correct, though, are our letterheads. You should work under the assumption that those are correct. So let's just look at a couple of letterheads, because I talked about in our last lecture that you shouldn't change letterheads. Let me just show you an example of one. You can see here um, that certain parts are centered, certain parts are right and left justified. Um, Again, this might not be the way that you would set up a letterhead. Sometimes I'll have students who say, well, I don't like this, so I rearranged the things in a way that I thought was more pleasing. Maybe it is even better, but it doesn't really matter whether it's better or worse or just different. The issue is, does it exactly match this? And this is what you need to go for. Another thing some of the students do is they can't figure out exactly how to get this document into their document. So they type it up but a lot of times they don't keep all the formatting things. I'll look at the formatting to make sure that you haven't made any changes. So if you're having difficulty knowing how to use this, that's okay, just come see me, I'll be glad to show you. That's all I had to do to get the format. And you can see that I'm now ready to put my date in here um, and proceed from here. So um, that's an example of one of the formats. So you might say here, see here, um, well, the, the name of the law firm isn't centered. Who knows why they didn't want to center it? That's okay. That's the model you have to work with. And so please go ahead and don't change it. 
The other models though, in most cases you will want to change them. And again, if you're not sure, if you're, if you're is this one of the ones I'm supposed to change or is it not? Just come see me in the office hours and we'll work on it together and figure it out, okay? So that's the letterhead part that I wanted to be sure that everybody knew how to find that. And um, I talked about modified block format because that's the format we use in this class, but I mentioned in passing the block format. I'm not going to explain to you what the block format is because as soon as I do that, somebody's going to start doing it in block format. But the general idea is that everything is on the left margin. That's not the one we're doing in this class. Now I call our format modified block format and that is its name, but there are lots of different iterations of modified block format. So if you Google modified block format, don't assume that whomever posted their version of modified block format, it's going to be identical to mine. It's more of an umbrella term for lots of different formatting things. You may find somebody out there who's posted something that's exactly like mine, but just better to use mine than to rely upon uh, what you may or may not find on the internet. Here are the components that we're going to be working with in this business letter. So far we've done the date, and we've done the mode of delivery. Again, I've clarified about the mode of delivery. For this class, we're going to list it even if it is first class mail return receipt requested. So now we're ready to do the inside address. So let's return to our cheat sheet. If you haven't had the chance to write down all of the stuff on the cheat sheet. I'm going to post it up here for a second. Uh, go ahead and, and pause me and get all that information down. I'm going to scroll a little bit farther. Go ahead and write that information down. And we have now the date. Pause me and write this information down. And our mode of delivery. Okay, so now we're going to start with new material. We're going to start with the inside address. The inside address is the place where you, the letter writer, writes the recipient's name and address. We call it inside address because it actually goes inside the letter or goes inside the envelope if you prefer to think of it that way. You could say that the outside address is the address that you put actually on the envelope. Now, there's uh, uh, a couple of different ways of approaching the outside address. We're not learning about the outside address in this course, but it's helpful, I think, to understand a little bit about the outside address so that you can understand a little bit more about the inside address. Historically, what legal secretaries did was they um, just took the inside address and typed up that as the envelope. Um, Nowadays, that is perhaps less commonly used because the Postal Service is asking that we format our envelope a little bit differently. For example, they would like for everything to be in capital letters and they would like for there to be no punctuation and they would like for you to use um, your two letter state abbreviation. For, for Texas, it's TX, right? Um, None of those things are bad, but they don't look right in the inside address. So you're going to have to make some changes in the, uh, uh, in the you're going to start with a nice inside address and then when you cut and paste that to go on the label for the um, outs for the envelope, you're going to need to do some formatting changes. Um, but most people start with the inside address and then make those changes and then put them on the outside. Um, address. So that's part of the reason why we have the inside address kind of the way that it that it is structured. Um, is it wrong or do you have to follow the post office rules? No you don't and there are plenty of law firms who don't like that look, who don't like the all capital letters with no punctuation. It may help the 
the Postal Service's machines process the mail more quickly and more efficiently, but it's not very attractive. And so there are law firms that say, no, we're not going to do that. Uh, your law firm might take one or the other view. You know, on the positive, following those rules means that your mail is going to kind of be more reliably delivered, maybe even quicker, but it's not going to be as attractive. Um, doing it the more attractive way may cause there to be some increased likelihood of it getting lost. So uh, just follow whatever your law firm prefers in those particular respects. Um, put this in parentheses here. Um, so that's the story behind the inside address. Um, so let's talk about how we're going to actually format the inside address. First thing is it's going to go below the mode of delivery. You can skip a line or you can make it the line directly below the mode of delivery. Part of the reasons why you can put it directly below is the mode of delivery is going to be over here on the right side and your inside address is going to be right here on the left side. And so um, they really aren't going to be kind of too awkwardly stacked on each other. I've seen people attempt to put the first line of the inside address on the line as the mode of delivery. We're not going to be doing it in this class. Again, gosh, if you were really struggling to get it on one page, maybe that would be something you'd consider doing, but you don't need to do it in this class because I'm not going to give you a letter that you have to write that's so long that it's not going to easily fit on one page. So please don't do that. Inside address goes below the mode of delivery it doesn't go on, on the same line as the mode of delivery. And whether you do one line or two line is really your call. We're going to start all of the lines of the inside address on the left margin. So they're all going to go right here. This is the first thing in our letter that's gone on the left margin. We've tabbed something over and we've right justified, but now we're going to be left justifying. So we're going to use this button right here. Again, we're in the home base. We're in the paragraph section and we're going to choose this one. This is kind of where you're expecting material in a document to start. So the first line is where you give the person's name. A common error that people do in this area is that they drop off the honorific. The honorific is the Mr., Ms., Doctor, Professor, Honorable. You know, if you were talking to somebody who'd been knighted, you might say Sir. All of those terms that go before the name. Um, Commonly, people do leave this off when there's assignments and they're going to get a deduction. So don't be that person. Go ahead and use the honorific. In this class, we're going to be using, I think all of our examples involve Mr., Ms., or Honorable. Those are the only three that we need to use for this purpose. Sometimes people say, well, what about if the lady is married? I'm writing a letter to a person who's married. She's a woman. Should I use MRS? We don't routinely use MRS anymore. It's not incorrect. You may have a client uh, who prefers MRS. Um, and under those circumstances, obviously, you do what the, the uh, recipient would like you to do. You don't want to offend the recipient. But especially when you are in a professional relationship with somebody, like opposing counsel or another paralegal, almost always they are going to prefer MS whether they are married or not. Because again, who cares whether this person is married or not? It has nothing to do with your business relationship with them. If you are assisting somebody maybe in a divorce or an adoption or a will, something that is involving their personal life, it's possible that they will prefer MRS. I myself wouldn't ask them. Um, I would just uh, uh, try, you know, uh, see by maybe how they sign their names or maybe they express a preference, that would be my indication. Again, for this class, you won't be using MRS at all. But if you had somebody who preferred MRS, obviously you should use it. So when do you use honorable? For our purposes, we just use them for district court clerks and for judges. There are other people that you can use honorable for, but um, for our purposes, just judges and district court clerks. Sometimes people want to use attorney as an honorific, and they'll say something like um, this. They, they might have this to be their, their line. They might say, attorney Samantha Green. Um, 
while certainly Samantha Green is an attorney, and there's nothing wrong with saying attorney Samantha Green, just like you might say secretary Samantha Green. In American English, though, attorney isn't a title like Mr. Ms. It's like a, a job, um, or you might say, you know, landscape architect Samantha Green. So um, you would still want to, on your first line, go Ms. Samantha Green um, and not include that as a title. I mean, as, a, as an honorific that goes before the name. Let's say, though, that you know this person's name is Sam Green. You may not know whether Sam is short for Samuel or Sam is short for Samantha. So what do you do? Well, in this case, you are not going to put an honorific in front of it unless this person happens to have a doctorate or is a professor or is an honorable, because obviously these terms are gender neutral. You don't want to offend somebody by calling them Mr. when they're a Ms. or calling them Ms. when they're a Mr. So you're going to leave it um, with just the name Sam Green. But that's the only time. So there are some names, uh, common names in American English that that is true for, um, for example, Pat, Sam, uh, Chris, those are common ones. Um, I have an example here. Oh, we'll get to this one second. Um, but uh, it may also be someone who is from a different culture. Maybe you aren't familiar with whether that name in that culture tends to be male or female. So you would obviously want to use just without the, the honorific. You can do a little bit of quick research if, if it's easy without becoming stocky about it. You may ask somebody in the office, hey, have you ever met such and such? And they may be able to tell you, oh, that's a woman, that's a man, um, and resolve the issue going forward. So that I mean, it may wor be worth a few minutes. If you're gonna spend the time to write a letter to somebody, you might as well get that right. But sometimes it may not be possible to get that right. And so it's fine to just say first name and last name. Okay, so after the honorific, add that person's first and last name. So we have here an example. Miss Emily Bronte. You may recall she was a novelist, and this little E, the symbol over the E is called an umlaut. I wanted to take just a second to show you how to do unusual characters. Um, it could be an accent mark, it, um, uh, of some type or some different uh, character that we don't commonly use in American English. So the way that we go about doing that in Word is we go over here to insert and we go over here to symbol. We're going to have to go to more symbols and we can find tons of different symbols. One symbol that we're going to use pretty commonly is a symbol for section. There's the pilcrow, a uh, checkbox, you can see this is an E with an accent mark, dollar sign set. There's some common ones that you're going to use all the time that will probably end up being located here. But as you, uh, maybe you don't commonly need to use, um, you can see maybe these are, I don't know, uh, Greek letters? I don't know, maybe Cyrillic? You can see that there would be, um, all kinds of characters that you might have. Maybe you had somebody who um, was a from a maybe from a speak Spanish, and maybe they have I don't even know what you call it, but the little uh, snaky thing on top of the N. Uh, maybe their name is Trevino, and you've been you want to make sure you're spelling it correctly, and they put the little snaky thing on top of their N. Well, you want to put the little snaky thing on top. You will find it here. I may not be able to find it real quick, but trust me, it's located on here. So just be sure to do that. And again, once you've used it, you can see I used the umlaut recently. Once you use the E with the umlaut, that's the double dots, it's going to be here for a while. And so if I need to type Emily Bronte's name again, I don't have to worry about going through this big search. I can just click on that and add that. So anyway, just a little reminder about how to take care of that going forward. Okay, so after you have the name of the person with the honorific, now you're going to list the title if you want to. 
You don't have to list the title. I would say it's never necessary, but it's common to do so. Now, let me just pause for a second and talk about another issue. If you do not know the name of the recipient, you can use the title instead. So let's say I'm sending a letter to the head of personnel at a particular company, but I don't know that person's name. So I could say a human resources manager or director of human resources or whatever that particular a title would be. Obviously then I'm not going to use an honorific. That's less than ideal. You don't want to do that um, if you do know, do know the name, but it, it's a good approach if you really don't have the ability to find that name. So obviously if you don't know the name, you're going to have to use the title. Um, if you do know the person's name, you can add the title to the next line. You don't have to. You're going to capitalize all the letters and all the major words. So I have an example here. Assistant to the Chief Executive Officer. So assistant is the first name and the first word in the title, so you're always going to capitalize it. It's a noun also, so you're going to capitalize it anyway. You're going to capitalize officer because it's a noun and it's the last word in the title. Chief and executive in this context act as adjectives, so those are also going to be capitalized. Little words like to and the, if they're not the first word or the last word, they aren't going to get capitalized. So just capitalize all the major words, but not necessarily all of the words. So this is the title. You'll notice I don't put a comma after this. The end of each line of your inside address doesn't get any punctuation unless it happens to end with a period because you have an abbreviation. For example, this period here is fine because it's an abbreviation of incorporated but you're not going to put a comma here. You would if you had Al and Texas on this same line, but since you're stacking them, you don't put a comma in this particular place. Okay, so we have our title worked out. It's optional, but if you're gonna include it, this is the way to format it. Sometimes people choose to put the title of the person on the same line as the name. It's not wrong to, if you want to, you can. It can make that line look pretty long, so I wouldn't do it if the title was very long. If you choose to put the title on the same line as the noun, as a name, then you're going to, let me just add, give an example. So it's Mr. Bob White. Okay, that would be how you'd format it. So I'm not going to have this comma if the title is on another line. If it's like this, this would be how I do it. But if it's going to be on the same line, I'm going to have a comma and a space there. I'm going to get rid of all the pilcros, so it doesn't, you know, all the uh, formatting so it doesn't seem too distracting. Now again, most of the time you're probably going to stack it. If you're running out of space, uh, putting the title on the same line as the name can be a way of saving some space. The next line you're going to have is the name of the business. And again, you're just going to write the name as it exists. And generally speaking, you're going to follow its customs into what it capitalizes and what it doesn't. Except if it typically capitalizes all the letters in the name, you're probably not going to do that unless it's just a series of abbreviations. So if it's Exxon, most of the time you see Exxon, it seems to be all in caps. Well, don't do it that way. Go ahead and do the capital E, the smaller case, XXON. And here we have Sun Electronics, comma, Inc. But again, if they don't usually put a comma here, don't put a comma. If they don't put a period at the end, you can leave the period off. This again is going to be its own line. Let's say that you are writing to Bob White, the assistant to the chief executive officer, but you're writing to him because you're doing his will. Well, that has nothing to do with his employment with Sun Electronics. So you're not going to include his title and you're not going to include his employer. You only include that information if you're writing to him because he's functioning as a representative of that particular company. So even though you, you if you're doing as well, obviously you need to know where he's employed, you aren't going to send it to his place of employment. You're not going to include in the inside address the name of his employer or his title. 
So the next two or three lines are going to be the mailing address and even can be longer than that in some cases. It's fine to use abbreviations. Don't worry too much about them. It, it, you can use kind of as you see appropriate. I could have abbreviated sweet here if I wanted to. I could have spelled out avenue if I wanted to. Uh, just kind of use your own judgment about what you think works. For the city line and state line, and you do need a separate line for this, you can't put this up here on this line. You're going to have a comma. Actually, let me turn on formatting. You're going to have a comma here, a space, uh, obviously capitalizing Texas. Um, if you want to use a state abbreviation, you can. It would be okay if you did this, or it'd be okay if you use that. Well, I think it looks better to write it all out, and Texas is not an especially long name, but that's your call. And then you put one or two spaces here for the zip code. We know that there's always five zip codes in the, the zip code. Sometimes people will put the extra four digits, and you certainly can do that. Just make sure that when you're doing the address, you get it exactly right. Um, you know, if, if uh, it's suite 300 and you put suite 30, it's probably not going to find it or may not find its way to its person. If you leave off one of the five digits, who knows where it's going to end up. So this is it's always important to proof everything in your letter, but this is an important part to proof. And again, you can space this out in more lines. If you wanted to, you could put the suite number on its own line. But if you're struggling to get it all on one page, this is definitely a, a time that you could save a little space. You aren't going to, as I said before, you're not going to put a period here. Nope. You're not going to put a comma here. Nope. You're just going to leave it without. So you're, there will be no commas at the end of any of your lines on the inside address. The only thing you might have at the end of the line is a period due to an abbreviation. So that is our inside address. Now let's move on and work on the ray line. We've already worked on a ray line in um, the uh, email and also in the inner office mail. So this should be pretty familiar. Um, the first thing that we're going to do, though this part's different, is that we're going to tab in just one time. Um, so we're going to indent the ray line a little bit. We're still going to keep it left justified, but we're going to do one tab here. So when we show our formatting, we're going to have a single arrow there. Um, after the ray, the R, the E, we're going to put a colon and then we're going to tab once. It's best not to even use a space, so I'm just going to hit tab like that. And that's good. That's the formatting that I want. And then once we hit tab, we can type the topic of the email. The same things that we talked about in terms of identifying a topic for the inner office mail and the email are going to apply here. You want the topic to uh, uh, summarize the contents of your letter. It's perhaps a little bit more common to have more than one topic in a letter because you don't want to send out like four letters to somebody in a week. It kind of makes sense to, to consolidate. So you might find yourself having a bit longer of a subject line. If you, have a, if you have more than one topic, you need to list all of the topics in your array line. It shouldn't be grammatically a sentence. Um, so don't worry about punctuation. You don't need any. You shouldn't put any punctuation. Just like um, the, the title of a uh, novel or play or, or whatever, you're going to capitalize the first word, I guess, and last word. And all major words should begin with a capital letter. The little words like the and uh, for all of those words should be lowercase. Um, you can Google the rules for titles of books and what they whatever words they tell you should be lowercase. That would also apply to the ray line. After you've given the topic or topics, um, let me just add here on the topic of the email, the topic of the letter. You may have more than one topic. Okay, so after you have all of your topics, that's when you enter the client matter information. You may recall we talked about before that it's oftentimes an alphanumeric combination. 
Um, so you would just put that typically in parentheses, but it doesn't have to be in parentheses uh, to identify the client matter information. You could also include other information, such as um, uh, the, the style of the case, the cause number, the number that's associated with that case with the clerk's office. Uh, you can also sometimes, this makes sense, is to give the, your recipient's file number. Let's say you're corresponding with opposing counsel and you've received letters from him or her that um, are uh, uh, regarding the same case. And you've noticed, hey, they happen to use this file number. If you want, you can include their file number on it. It makes it easier for them to file. Hey, it's a very small task for you to do that might create just a scoon of goodwill. Not a ton, but it is something to think about. Probably even a better time to do that would be if uh, your client is a business, they will probably have assigned a, a, some type of filing number to this matter. So including that number in for your client is going to be helpful. So definitely consider possibly doing that. Now sometimes your array line is going to be just a single line, which is great. You're, you're done once you've given those two pieces of information. But um, if you're having more than one topic in your letter or you want to provide additional information such as their file number, you're probably going to find that it's, it's useful to go ahead and, and have more than one uh, uh, file number, I mean have more than one uh, line for your uh, for your uh, ray line, and that's perfectly fine. Again, if you're fighting to keep it all on one page, keep it all on one line. You can almost always be successful at doing that. Um, there, it, doing the second line of a ray line uh, doesn't present a lot of concerns, but there is one that I want to flag, and that is that you want all of your subsequent lines to line up with your first line, first word in your ray line, not the R. But the first you know part that you're adding to it. So in our next line, if A is supposed to line up with the D, the B is supposed to line up with the D. And this is all vertical. Again, how can you make sure about it? Well, usually, let me just go to another line here. Okay, usually we're gonna start, we're gonna start our ray line right here on our left margin. We're gonna tab one time in. And so usually you're going to find that you're going to need to do two taps to line it up. Because Ray's pretty short. But it's possible, depending upon the font that you use, that you might need three taps. I think I did three taps that time. So um, you just want to make sure that they line up. Some strategies to doing that is just counting the tabs. Another strategy is to bring it up, slide it up so you can see exactly where it is. And of course, you can pick your own location for tabs. You don't have to use the preset tabs. You can see it's right here at one inch. And you can, if you're wanting to make sure, you can slide up and down to get that just exactly the way you want it to go. So that is how you make sure that it all lines up. Um, we've, uh, we talked initially about how uh, the, you're not going to play around with your letterhead. It's pretty common for the letterhead to be in bold, and it's pretty common for the ray line to be in bold. Other than those two lines, though, you shouldn't have anything else in bold. Um, you might put your mode of delivery in italics or have it underlined or both, but really these, those are the only two parts that you ought to systematically put in bold. Now, that doesn't mean that in the body of your letter you can't bold a bullet or two, or you can't bold certain words, maybe a date or an address. That can be really, really helpful. I encourage you to do that. But of course, if you bold the whole section, nothing is going to stand out because everything's bolded. So the only time, the only sections that you're going to want to do globally in bold is going to be your letterhead, if that's the way your firm likes to present it, and the ray line. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. So um, now we're going to do the um, salutation and um, we will save the body for the next presentation or next uh, lecture. So let's look at our salutation. 
it's you're going to skip a line between the bottom of the ray line and the salutation. You can skip two lines if you would like to. Again, if you want to kind of spread out your letter a little bit because your body's pretty short, you don't want it all on the very top of the page, there is some flexibility there in terms of spreading it out. We're going to start the salutation on the left margin, so no indention here. It's going to be at the same point as the inside address. We're going to start with the word dear, capitalizing it, and we're going to obviously do a space, and then we're going to use the name that we did before. So if our name, if, if our ad envelope was an address to Mr. Bob White, we're going to take Mr. Bob White, so it'll be Dear Mr. Bob White. Let me just type it here. And now we're going to put a colon here because again, this is a business correspondence, but we're going to remove the Bob. We're going to use the colon even if this relates to a personal matter in Mr. Bob White's life. For example, let's say he's going through a divorce. Very personal matter, obviously. But you're corresponding with him in your role as a business person, right? You're not uh, his best friend writing him a letter to encourage him during this difficult time. You're writing to him to give him legal assistance. And so your role in this process is professional. As a result, even if it relates to a truly personal issue in Mr. White's life, you're going to use a colon. And in fact, at any time in this course, we're going to be using a colon. So we're not going to include his first name. We're going to include his honorific and his surname. Let's say he's opposing counsel. We aren't going to write attorney here, attorney Bob White. No, we're just, because again, that's not the title. We're going to go with Mr. or whatever the particular name is. The only time that we would include um, the first name would be in this situation. We're writing to Chris McGinnis, but we don't happen to know whether Chris is short for Christopher or Christina or some other name. We don't know his or her gender, and so we are including Chris McGinnis, both names, because we can't use Mr. or Ms. You might say, well, why don't we just use, hey, dear Chris? Well, obviously that suggests a level of for informality that we don't have. I mean, if we don't know the person's gender, we're not ready to first name them obviously. So um, we're, we're, we're not left with a lot of good choices. I will concede that Dear Chris McGinnis is not the most elegant way of addressing somebody. So if there's a relatively easy way to figure out Chris's gender, then you ought to, and then of course replace Chris with Mr. or Ms. Um, so that is our salutation section. And so at this point, we're going to um, Confirm that we have done the, um, here we go. We're going to check off our inside address because we've covered that. And we have handled our reference line or our ray line. That's what ray is short for, reference. And we have also handled our greeting or salutation. So when we are back together, we will continue on and handle the other parts of the letter. You'll see as we go through here, I do have a few hints about these parts of the letter. Um, but we will spend more time uh, talking about tone and other things in our next section where we uh, address the body of the letter. So again, thank you for your attention. I hope this information has been helpful and I look forward to seeing you in the next lecture. Take care.